Good evening. Welcome to Left, Right and Centre. I'm Vishnu Shom. On the programme tonight, it's a judgement that's come as a shocker at a time when sexual harassment and sexual assault is a constant reality in India. An order from the Bombay High Court, a judge indicates that there must be skin-to-skin -skin contact with sexual intent for an act to be considered a sexual assault. We'll be joined by the additional Solicitor General Pinky Anand, the Supreme Court lawyer Vrinda Grover and the author and columnist Shobha De in a little while from now. Also on the show tonight, the wealth of Indian billionaires went up 35% during the COVID period, while 84% of households in India suffered a loss in income in April 2020 alone. The Global Inequality Report by Oxfam's findings on India are out. We'll be speaking to their South Asia head to find out what they say. It's a judgment that's come as a shocker at a time when sexual harassment, sexual assault is a constant reality in our country. An order from a Bombay High Court judge indicates that there must be skin-to-skin -skin contact with sexual intent for an act to be considered sexual assault. The judge was hearing the case of a 12-year-old girl who was groped. The man who did this was acquitted of the tougher POSCO Act that entails three years imprisonment to get a reduced sentence of one year. Justice Pushpa Ganediwala ruled, and this to many is the shocker, the act of pressing of breast of the child aged 12 years in the absence of any specific detail as to whether the top was removed or whether he inserted his hand inside the top and pressed her breast would not fall in the definition of sexual assault. Now, the National Commission for Women in just the last little while has tweeted saying that they will be challenging this order. Well, joining us now to look at this, uh, the additional Solicitor General Pinky Anand. We are also joined by the senior advocate of uh, the Supreme Court, Vrinda Grover. Shobhade, the author and columnist, joins us as well. Um, Ms. Anand, let me come to you first. One of the, one of the most bizarre uh, sort of parts of this judgment is, is this. And I quote, Admittedly, it is not the case of the prosecution that the appellant removed her top and pressed her breast. As such, there is no direct physical contact, i.e. skin-to-skin contact, with sexual intent without penetration. Isn't this bizarre that there needs to be skin-to-skin -skin contact for sexual assault to have been proven? Uh, Vishnu, actually, I, I think there are so many words that can be used for this, but bizarre is as appropriate as any to say, uh, this is a situation where we've been grappling, you know, for sexual assault being made to be an offense which actually is prohibitive rather than something which allowed things to happen. Even when Section 354, prior to the amendment, the whole attempt was to make it wide-ranging so that there was no ambiguity left whatsoever. In these circumstances, considering the POXO Act and considering that it is meant for this, the protection of children, and this uh, girl was 12 years of age, the whole idea of physical contact, meaning that there must be removal of clothes, is something which is preposterous. I, I mean, nothing short of that is something which would appeal to anybody. Uh, and I think we are all amazed at the fact that there could be such a judgment. Firstly, you have acquittal at the first stage. Then you have a reversal of the High Court, uh, the Nagpur bench. And then you say that 354 is applicable simply because it has a minimum punishment of one year and not to convict the, um, the accused under uh, the POXO Act, where the minimum imprisonment is uh, three years, and talking about proportional uh, situation, I think it, it, it just is something that is repulsive to one's understanding of what the law is and what it is meant to do, because it is meant to protect children. And sexual assault, uh, with or without a removal of clothes, is a concept which I think is not only alien to the concept of the entire act, but it's something which is unbelievable and cannot be accepted. In fact, let's get into that. Vrinda Grover, let me quote again from what the judge said. The question for consideration of this court is whether the pressing of breast and attempt to remove salwar would fall within the definition of sexual assault as defined under Section 7 and punishable under Section 8 of the POXO Act. Isn't this perhaps the most regressive part of this, of this judgment, this particular statement? You know, I really think let's look at Section 7. Mm -hmm. And Section 8 uh, gives awards punishment for the crime of sexual assault under POXO. So let's read what Section 7 says so that we understand what is happening. Because I have today looked at judgments from Kerala High Court, Sikkim High Court, Bombay High Court, Delhi High Court, 
all of which have convicted not only where breast has been touched through clothes, but also when hand, etc., have been forcibly taken or uh, there is a possible kiss which has been planted. So clearly this judgment of the Bombay High Court is at odds with the manner in which POXO has been, uh, this section has been interpreted and convictions have been awarded. What does Section 7 say? Whoever with sexual intent touches the vagina, penis, anus or breast of the child or makes the child do the same, etc. So there are two limbs to it. Or does any other act with sexual intent which involves physical contact without penetration is said to commit sexual assault? So the first part actually specifies certain parts of the body where with sexual intent there is touching. And breasts are one of them. And the language used is sexual intent touches. Right. The second limb talks of physical contact of any other part if with sexual intent. What the, we have, what, if you will look at the judgments around Section 7 of POXO, you will see that even when forcibly the hand is held or a kiss is planted with sexual intent, courts have actually convicted under Section 7. Here we have a case where if you look in the context of this case, not only was this girl uh, uh, fraudulently taken away by the accused, uh, there was clearly the, perhaps an attempt being made to go beyond. Yes, it was. In uh, fact, that's uh, mentioned. There, there could have been, this could have been an attempt at rape. By, by the grace of God, it she was, got away. But there yes. is mention it of this as well. It was the neighbor who intervened. I just want to bring in one more point here. I do, however, want us to, to cons because she is clearly what is weighing on the mind of the judge is the mandatory minimum sentence. And therefore, she's leaning... And the interpretation of law, with all due respect, is not what Section 7, how Section 7 can be read. Right. But this is a, 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 an interpretation that has been carved out because the court is clearly uncomfortable giving the mandatory minimum sentence right. of three years and therefore finds the path through Section 354, therefore confirming that she believes in the credibility of all the witnesses. Uh, so th what we need to therefore do here is just... And this I'm only putting as an issue out there. I know when we are outraged, we don't want to think. Mandatory minimum sentencing without discretion may in the long run start proving counterproductive when the mandatory minimum has a higher threshold. So perhaps we need to discuss that as a separate issue. This is what you uh, see here. However, what we do need to say, even when courts are reasoning like this, we, I see no semblance of an acknowledgement of the trauma of the child. Surely the, the experience and the trauma that child sexual abuse will leave on a child is not going to necessarily vary if it is through a t-shirt or without a t-shirt. And we don't see that sensitivity in the language and the reasoning that is deployed by the court. No, here. absolutely. And, and, and Vrinda, I think that is perhaps one of the most important parts of POXO, that it was designed with the child in mind. The child wouldn't be treated as a victim. The child would be taken through the process. Where in this judgment, which I've read very carefully, was there any effort at trying to show empathy to the child? It seemed to be entirely missing. But Choba, let me come to you, come to you next. There is, some would say, a false equivalence which is being sought to be made over here. Uh, and that false equivalence has to do with sexual assault and something and any other act. Brinda was talking about this and the judge says, and I quote, the words any other act encompasses within itself the nature of acts which are similar to the acts which have been specifically mentioned in the definition on the premise of a principle. The act should be of the same nature or closure to that. So any other act needs to be sexual assault in, in the judgment is what this judge feels Otherwise, it's just not. It's something else. Isn't that strange? There are many strange aspects uh, to this case. And uh, let's uh, start by saying that the most vulnerable section of our society is the girl child. Now, in this judgment, as has been pointed out, there was no empathy. There was no reference to the girl's trauma. And apart from anything else, sexual intent itself 
it's uh, so ambiguous who decides what the intent is or was in this girl's case clearly she had been lured according to reports by a guava yes. lured lured not just because he wanted to grope her breasts over her t-shirt but perhaps as has been mentioned uh, he would have gone much further there could have been a possibility of rape had a neighbor not intervened apart from that the girl herself was traumatized enough to cry to report what had happened and to take it all the way through and her mother registered this FIR. Now a child is so vulnerable and the way this has been worded is crude to say the least. Um, a woman's body, a child, a female child's body has been deconstructed in a manner so blatant and so ugly. Now, we are going to start talking about under the t-shirt, over the t-shirt, uh, breasts, buttocks, legs, lips, hands, feet. Where does it uh, uh, stop? You know, it, one would rather go with a much stricter look at uh, what had taken place, a much stricter verdict than uh, on the side of, the, of leniency. Now, this seems to me you are letting... Uh, you're sending out a very strong message to other people out there and child pornography as we all know I mean the incidents have gone up in a way that is absolutely terrifying children are vulnerable and this judgment is it's I, I consider it almost perverse in the way it's uh, been projected is telling people out there that it's okay it's not exactly sexual assault but it is something slightly less because there's no penetration and the girl has not been touched her vagina has not been touched and so on I mean really this is so terrible for anybody who has raised little girls to hear these kind of comments coming from a lady judge is distressing to say the least so what happens next is going to be very interesting to monitor since almost every women's organization and women across the country have raised their voices against the judgment there is an appeal at the Supreme Court level we'll wait and see how this pans out because protecting our girls protecting our vulnerable protecting children boys and girls should be a priority for society not to offer protection to a molester or a groper uh Pinky Anand, here's something else the judge said. The act of pressing the breast of a child aged 12 years in the absence of any specific detail as to whether the top was removed or whether he inserted his hand inside her top and pressed her breast would not fall under the definition of sexual assault. It would certainly fall within the definition of Section 354 of the IPC, which penalizes outraging the modesty of a woman. This is the basis of the judgment. Uh, uh, Vishnu. It's actually something that, you know, again, I go back to history. 354, when it was enacted, was found to be hopelessly inadequate to beat sexual assault. And it came to a very minimal and nominal statement of saying, outraging the modesty of a woman. Yes. In fact, that is the whole reason this entire section was amended to, as I said, include within its ambit all kinds of sexual advances and assaults, which actually uh, came in the category of assault and not outraging the modesty of a woman. So having said this, I'm sorry, what emerges from this judgment is also uh, this possibly, if I may say, antiquated notion of the fact that when there is no penetration, there is no sexual assault. Now, this is the broad purview that we had tried to change with the amendments to say penetration is not something which makes it a sexual assault. Sexual assault can be sans uh, penetration also. So this entire argument or this entire uh, observation of the learned court to say that the clothes were not removed or that there was no physical contact, there was no skin-to-skin -skin contact. I mean, these are all alien to the concept of assault. And I think this needs to be dealt with uh, very quickly and very sternly because the message that has to go across is that any form of sexual assault, and that particularly to a child, uh, an, an innocent uh, child who's being assaulted in this fashion, is something that cannot be let off on the ground that it is outraging the modesty of a woman as opposed to sexual assault. And I'll just say one more feature, uh, Vishnu here. Vinda had commented on the minimum sentence being something which sometimes tends to, you know, take away from the gravity and therefore there is more grappling with that. The reason minimum sentences were made in, in any of these offenses was that you couldn't be more lenient. I'll again go back to 354. Section 354 at one point uh, had a sentence which could be minimal nothing or not even a fine. In a particular case that I was doing, I still recall, the court in a rape case had let off 
the accused in the high court which we of course got uh, reversed by the supreme court uh, where in fact only a 3000 rupee fine was uh, was put on the accused uh, on account of this action so the entire focus is we need to orient ourselves towards a society which looks at sexual assault as a complete outrage against humanity right. and to be treated in that category with a minimum sentence of course and more so when it deals with a girl child in fact vinda that's important the, the key point here my last question over here is that the protection of children from sexual offences act poxo clearly mentions what sexual assault is and it clearly says when a person touches the child or makes the child touch them or someone else it doesn't define the touches with clothes or without clothes it's just the use of the word touch For, as, as a lawyer as a lawyer aren't judges or uh, all lawyers bound to go by what a particular uh, a, a particular act says there is an act over here it's on a piece of paper how do you not refer to what it says absolutely you're right and that is why this particular judgment uh, reinterprets uh, section 7 to uh, create this business about uh, the touch means that the touch has to be from skin to skin which is nowhere either the intent or the content of section 7 nor as i said there are judgments of various high courts across the country which have repeatedly convicted under section 7 for where there is no necessarily uh, the 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 touch doesn't have to be to the flesh this is a completely uh, uh, you know distorted reading of section 7 i want to make one more point here please remember this is a, a gender neutral law for children so in this case the court has gone into 354 outraging modesty of a woman slash girl what if this is a boy B uh, little boys need to be protected True. against sexual offences and sexual Absolutely. assault and sexual abuse what would the judge have done then yeah uh, if it was touching the penis through a trouser then does that boy child have no protection left under our laws so we need to really think what is how do we read poxo act All right. I'd like to thank you all very much for uh, for joining us, and I think it's wonderful that the National Commission for Women, which has come out with a detailed tweet on why they find this to be uh, regressive, uh, something that's potentially dangerous, um, they're going to challenge this, and it just needs to be seen at what level and how they are going to do this. I'd like to thank you all very much for being with us. Well, let's uh, quickly move on now to our next big focus uh, this evening. Well, the Oxfam report is usually presented at the uh, World Economic Forum meet. Uh, in Davos this year it's been covid and it's not been presented there but the findings are stark the global inequality report usually uh, which is released in Davos Switzerland speaks among other things on the impact of covid on india it refers to it as the inequality virus and the india supplement of the report speaks about how india's wealthiest got richer through the months of the pandemic while millions continued to languish the wealth of indian billionaires has increased by 35% during the lockdown 84% of the household suffered a loss of income in april 2020 uh, alone that's another key point uh, that's been reported through the months of covid till the end of october the number of students affected by the closure of educational institutes stands at over 32 crores of those 84% reside in rural areas and 70% attend government schools Now Oxfam India survey reports that close to 40% of teachers in government schools fear that the prolonged school closure might lead uh, to a third of the students not returning once schools do reopen. Now education has been massively impacted because of the digital divide. Only 4% of rural households had a computer. Less than 15% rural households had an internet connection and this is really staggering out of a total of 122 million who lost their jobs 75% which accounts for 92 million jobs were lost in the informal sector now the global inequality report is a report that is actually produced uh, at for release at the world economic forum meet in davos in switzerland very much called the playground of the rich This year there is no Davos World Economic Forum because of COVID but these numbers in that COVID period show once again how inequitable 
the distribution of wealth is, not just in the world, but that inequality is in India as well. Well, joining us now, Amitabh Behar, the CEO of Oxfam India. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Amitabh. Um, among all the nations in the world, is India among the starkest in terms about how the rich got richer during the months of COVID while mil millions languished because of the disease? Thank you, Vishnu. Uh, India is certainly one of the starkest. You talked of the India data. Let me just quickly add a couple of uh, global data points. You know, it, it, I, I found it absolutely startling that uh, during COVID, the top 10 billionaires of the world actually added $500 billion to their kitty. Now, one more data from the global list, the top 1,000 billionaires uh, were able to recover the losses they had because of COVID within uh, nine months. And I think that's, that's where the big story is. Uh, the, uh, where several studies, including the World Bank, are saying that common and ordinary people, ordinary citizens are going to take almost a decade to come back to the pre-pandemic levels. So, so that's the level of, of difference. And, and you talked of the India figures. We have, uh, you know, uh, during the COVID, top 11 billionaires of India actually earned enough wealth which could sustain the NREJ for 10 years or the Ministry of Health for 10 years. So, and, and on the other hand, you saw 24% of people actually living with uh, less than 3,000 a month. Yeah. And this is also the time, you know, uh, when the richest man in India was earning 90 crores an hour. So it, it's, it's really devastating. And I must say, bust the myth where people were saying that, you know, uh, the, the virus does not differentiate. Maybe the virus does not, but the systems that we have created it's very clear that the impact is very, very different on different segments of the people. Amitabh, uh, what I also found um, um, striking in a, in, in, you know, in a sad way was education and the inequality over there. We keep talking about online education as a way of dealing with um, COVID for children, but uh, the digital divide in this country is so stark that there are signs now that a lot of those kids, because of being absent from school for so long, may, no, may just not come back. Absolutely. So uh, uh, you mentioned the survey Oxfam did, and uh, we spoke to lots of teachers and, and their assessment is that we're going to lose a lot of children uh, to the pandemic. They'll not be coming back to school. Malala Fund has done a study which says that almost 20 million girls, so there is again a gender dimension to it, 20 million girls will not return to uh, uh, schools. And then if you really look at even the digital divide in terms of what's happening to the education scenario, you talked of, of uh, extremely low access to computers and internet in, in uh, rural areas, which, which stands around say 20% put together. But if you really go to the bottom 20% of the people, mm -hmm. uh, the access is even worse. It comes to around nine to 10% uh, put together access to computers and uh, internet. So there is a huge digital divide. And, and surprisingly, we have been looking at a lot of other questions, but there's not been enough attention on the question of, of education and what's going to be, uh, what are going to be the new challenges uh, when, when children start returning to schools. So one final question, you mentioned this, I just wanted to get that once again from you. How many years is it going to take for people to, who've been badly affected to uh, economically recover from the impact of COVID? So it's going to be, as in the World Bank study says, a decade uh, to come back to pre-pandemic uh, level. Uh, whereas, as I was saying, that the billionaires have already recovered and many of them have actually had windfall profits. Right. So, so that's, that's, that's the level that, of that, uh, that's impact. That's inequality that right there. Yeah, Thank you yeah. so much, Amitabh, for sharing this with us. And I think it's a sign of the times that uh, we aren't in da Davos at the World Economic Forum. Exactly a year back, we were talking about the report last year. This year, yeah. the world's playground of the rich has effectively evaporated because uh, so, the, the disease shows uh, no inequality. Everybody is affected by it. So, Vishnu, so, if I can get just one line, as in uh, we're going to be looking at the budget. Let's fundamentally reboot the budget in a way 
where we don't look at, you know, reducing the number of billionaires should be all right. We need many more nurses and teachers. That's, that's, that's the shift that we need to make. Amitabh Behar, always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much for being with us. Out of time on Left, Right and Centre. Uh, it's time for a short break. Sanket Upadhyay comes up next.